Um, so then, um, without further ado, I want to introduce our, our speaker tonight. So this lecture series is all about ocean exploring. And um, coincidentally, we were deciding on the topic when John called me. And John has um, visited us once before. Um, how many years ago? Six? Oh, 1873 eight. or four. <laughs> long, or time, long time ago. And I got this call from John many, many years ago. Um, and, and didn't know him at the time, and he had such an interesting story. We added him as a bonus lecturer at the time to our lecture series. And we had a great response because his lecture is so fascinating and so different from some of our more typical, I would call them academic presentations. And um, John actually is an academic. He is a scientist by training. I gather he does chemistry textbooks in his spare time. Is that true? Uh, yeah, I, I got my PhD in organic chemistry. And we wrote the first um, environmental science textbook in North America for Earth Day One in 1970. And then we did environmental science and earth science and uh, geology books for years. So, so John is well credentialed, and, um, but more recently has spent his time, uh, I think, out in the field. And this, <laughs> this lecture is truly about his exploration um, and introducing many of us to the discovery process that he's gone through. So tonight is about his most recent trip, I think, and the, the, and the book that you've written about it, Crocodiles and Ice. So uh, without any more delay, this is John Turk. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Jane. Yeah, I, I woke from a deep afternoon nap. You know the kind, when you open your eyes, you go, what, where am I? Who am I? What day of the week is it? Whose bed am I sleeping in? And then I saw the ceiling fan going, whoop, but a whoop, but a whoop, but a swaying on a frayed wire like it was about to fall off and land on my head. And I went, yeah, right, right, right. I remember now, yeah. I'm in Haneara, capital of the Solomon Islands, in the tropical South Pacific. I'm naked. I'm slimy with sweat. I'm stuck to the sheets in dried blood. Right, 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 I got it. I got it. Yeah, okay, I got a flight out of here on Friday. This is Wednesday. I got two days to kill. Hey, um, everybody here has a brain, right? Everybody got a brain, yeah? Well, let me tell you something about brains, just between you and me, right? Brains are real handy sometimes. Like when you have to do your taxes or take a driver's license exam or something like that. But brains can be a downright pain in the neck on a hot day in Haneara when you have to wait two days for your airplane because brains start to think, you see, they're trained to think. And brains sometimes when they think very often, they'll go off on this tangent, you know, they'll add up your life's resume, you know, and they'll come up with some feeling of incompleteness, like you haven't done something right, like woe is me, what am I doing at 65 years old, all dinged up again in pretty sore digs in this hotel room when I should be hanging out on the beach with club bed with a daiquiri in my hand and, and my sweet wife wrapped around my arms, you know? You know? I mean, any guru worth her website will tell you this is dangerous ground, but this is what your brain does, you see. So my brain kept saying, um, how did you get here? And sometimes you have to treat your brain like a three-year-old, you know, give it a rattle to take away the butcher knife, you know. And my brain definitely had the butcher knife in its hand, so I gave it the rattle. I said, well, I'm here because the crocodile didn't eat me. And that's how I'm going to start my story. <laughs> so, can we just push the, this button? Yeah. 
but I think it will work now. This button? You're going to work? You're going to make it work? Try it. Try going. There you go. Okay. Um, okay. So, I was, um, I had just finished a trip. I was doing a solo kayaking trip along the Solomon Island chain. I was in a sit-on-top kayak, which every serious kayaker will tell you is a toy, more more uh, useful in that uh, bay at the um, Club Med that I was talking about. But I wanted to take the minimal, most minimalist craft that I could be, the speck on the sea, this vulnerability thing, and be out of sight of land in the rolling waves of the uh, trade winds in the South Pacific. You know, I'll tell you another secret. I have full of secrets for you people today. If you're off the coast of Vancouver Island, let's say, and you get caught in a funny current, um, it's not that much of a problem because it's real hard to miss North America. You just go east, right? But when you're out there in the middle of the ocean and if you get a funny current and you start getting washed away and you're trying to hit a target island that's two kilometers in diameter, it's a much bigger problem, you see, because you don't want to get washed out to sea, right? So it turns out that I had underestimated this piece of ocean. I, I thought, you know, tropical islands, coconut trees and all that, it was going to be easy. And it turned out I had these cross currents and I was getting kind of beat up and uh, having a rough time, almost missing my targets a number of times. So, I had a real bad crossing to do, a real dangerous crossing. And before it, there was an uninhabited island, you see? And I thought, wow, this is going to be really cool, you see? I'll just go to this uninhabited island, I'm alone. I'll spend a day here, I'll be watching the ocean, I'll try to feel its moods, you know, you feel it really deeply inside you, and um, rest up and make the crossing at, at a perfect time and have an easy time of it. So I'm, I'm feeling real good about myself and I'm feeling really good about life, I'm gonna go and spend this this day or two on this uninhabited tropical island, white coral sand beaches, coconut trees, and all the solitude you could ask for. What? Well, I see a flash of motion out of the corner of my eye, you know, and I'm all alone. So I, there's nobody to talk to. Like, um, did you see that? What was that, you know? So now I'm a little on edge, you know. I don't know if uh, this is real or imagined. And I get to the beach and I start following the tracks. And see, this is the tracks of a... 15-foot man-eating crocodile. <laughs> see, and when I really track this animal, I see it's been basking on the beach, facing the shore. Saw me come in. It slithered on its belly down to the water, swam along for a while, ran back in. Now it's running up on its feet, belly not dragging, tail dragging, and it runs into the jungle. So I thought this was really cool. I got my camera out and I'm taking pictures, you know, this is good. And then I was wondering, you know, where's the croc, you see? And so I started tiptoeing to the edge of the jungle and, and the croc had run inland and then turned and kind of half buried itself and was coming back, you see? <laughs> and it wanted to eat me. This was my impression. So, I got my kayak and I paddled out and it was exactly the wrong part of the tide and I got real beat up and almost mixed the next island, but I didn't die. So, you know, I'm, I'm going through all this, but my mind on this hot day in Haniara still really feels it needs to go back to my childhood. So let's just give in. I grew up in a very loving family in suburban Connecticut, uh, older sister, younger brother and me. Um, everything was hunky-dory, I did well in school, went off to a prep school, um, Phillips Academy Andover, uh, one of my uh, classmates was George W. Bush. This was the route that was, um, you know, that my mother and father wanted me to follow. The only real argument is my mother wanted me to be a doctor and my father wanted me to be a chemist, otherwise the entire trajectory of my life was well defined. I went off to an Ivy League school, Brown University, 
And then you see I discovered fast motorcycles, <laughs> sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Okay, now ladies and gentlemen, let me just tell another secret. I was not the first 20-year-old young male to discover fast motorcycles, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. But in the process, my grades took a little dive, you see. And then something very interesting happened. See, they, whoever they is, decided that I was crazy. See? Oh, well that was interesting. I thought crazy meant you thought you were Napoleon or you didn't have any friends or you felt that your mother didn't love you. I didn't have any of those problems. And they sent me to the psychiatrist, you know. And he was a, a dressed up dandy dude in a, a you know, gray pinstripe suit sitting behind a big oaken desk like the desk of all the hierarchical command systems of the world. And he said, son, I want you to trust me. Whoa, I didn't trust him not one tiny bit. You see, I thought, I felt that his job was to change me from a bad boy, poor grades, to a good boy, good grades. See, I didn't need that kind of guidance right now. I was trying to think something through. And, you know, so to get him off my back and, uh, you know, I, I, I feigned contriteness. I said, well, you know, I'm really sorry. You know, just adolescent confusion. And, and, you know, I just wanted to go down the street and suit some pool. And then he feigned contriteness because uh, he wanted to go home and mow his lawn. So we went through this session. Let me tell you something. There is no confusion about getting on a souped up crotch rocket and lying down with your stomach on the tank and cranking the throttle full bore, feet spread out behind you like the tail feathers of a hawk and flying down the roadside at 100 miles an hour. Yeah. But, you know, we don't have to go there and I'm not advocating driving fast motorcycles, but what is important, especially in this day and age, especially this week, See, who gets to define what's crazy? Who gets to define sanity? And I'm 70 years old now, and I'm not sure that the sanity that our society defines for us is really the sanity that we need to be seeking. So this youthful rebellion, it was more than just sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It was a, an examination into the fundamentals of who we are and where we're going. And that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. So I ended up as a long distance expedition sea kayaker. This is Cape Horn, this is the Antarctic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean over there, the Atlantic Ocean over there. Um, it's no mistake that after all the rebellion, after questioning, my religion, my career, after going through a couple of marriages, and I ended up in a sea kayak, the smallest ocean-going boat in the world, with no responsibilities other to myself. Because, you know, I wouldn't make it. I, I realize now I would never have made it as a captain of an aircraft carrier with the responsibility to bomb small nations until the soils grow orange or the captain of a cruise ship with the mandate to create opulence for the people who can write the check to pay the price of admission. No, a kayak suits me just fine. Where I'm captain and crew, first mate and chief dishwasher where every wave washes over the deck. So scrotums on the bow stem, ladies and gentlemen, because the GPS doesn't always tell you where we are or how to get to the distant shore. So I did all these trips, and then in 1999, I decided I wanted to cross an ocean in a production sea kayak. And... Um, I ended up uh, trying to go across the Pacific from Japan to Alaska. 
Uh, you can't cross the Pacific in a production sea kayak just going straight across, so you have to follow the shore. So it's following up along the Kuril Islands and across Kamchatka and Siberia to Alaska. So it was a nasty piece of ocean, as we knew it would be, the North Bering Sea. I'd been a fisherman, for commercial fisherman, for five years in the North Bering Sea. So we were getting all beat up and, you know, all that kind of stuff and storms and everything. And, and, and one day we're paddling along and this storm comes up out of nowhere, no indication on my barometer watch, no nothing. And, and the wind is picking the waves up and blowing it into the rain. And the wind is taking the rain and blowing it into the waves till you can't see where the ocean ends and the air begins or the air ends and the ocean begins. It's all just mayhem. So we, we paddle to shore, you see, and this woman meets us on the beach. And she says, John, Misha, it's good to see you. We were expecting you. The grandmother created the storm to bring you to our village. She wants to talk to you. I go, okay. <laughs> right, so this is Bulanat. She was born during the reign of Tsar Nicholas II. Uh, she remembers standing on a hill um, as a young girl looking down on the beach with her father out on the beach trading reindeer with the Yankee gunrunners for Winchester rifles so she, her, her father and her tribe can fight the Bolsheviks for their liberty. Yeah, and she asked me to come back. She said, me and Misha, she grabbed me by the elbow. We had a brief visit, and she said, come back. It will be good as you do, if you do. And I spent five years off and on in this village in Siberia learning about the healing of these ancient shamans. And she took me deep into the spirituality and the power of the shamanic traditions in Northeast Siberia. And I wrote about this in the Raven's Big Gift, but that's not what we're talking about tonight. You see, so I'm on the road doing my dog and pony show and people come up all the time, and not all the time, the, the book has been very successful, but people do come up and they, they pick it up and they say, you know, shamans, I don't believe in shamans. And, um, it, it, you know, I don't want to go there. So um, I'm not going to buy your book. And of course I smile and say thank you very much. But what I decided to do in the next book, you see, is start out with scientific fact. And we're going to end up in the same place. That you, you can't get away from the shaman if you look at the world analytically and scientifically. So where I want to start is I want you to imagine, this is Maine, most people uh, have some experience with uh, a chainsaw. I want you to imagine going out into the forest with a stone ax and cutting down a two or three meter in diameter tropical hardwood tree with a stone ax. There's some carpenters in this room, I know that, and they and just give it a try, cutting, try cutting one pine log with a stone axe. It takes a while, and then they and then they're going to fast. They're going to cut down this huge monster tree and fashion it into a dugout canoe. Now I've changed scales here because there are no dugout canoes made in the old fashion way. And then sailing to and from across the ocean from Polynesia to Hawaii and back. No compass or anything like that. All the stone tools. Well, no one in the world today could do that. No society in the world today could do that. That involves a level of skill and engineering and patience and connectivity to the landscape that we've lost. And what difference does that make? See, we, we live in the Anthropocene, you know, we have all this stuff. You want to cut down a tree, you don't even need a chainsaw anymore. You just get one of these machines, man. It'll take that tree down real fast, you know. We have nuclear power plants and, oh yeah, forest fires, because that's where I live. 
Uh, we lost 17 houses this year to climate change um, in my immediate neighborhood to climate change forest fires. And, you know, anyway, we live in the, in the Anthropocene, but let's talk about deep ecology. We all love it, you know. I'd be dead by now if I didn't have modern medicine. So I'm not putting the Anthropocene down, but at the same time, I want us to take a journey into deep ecology, which is an unequivocal love and reciprocal relationship with the earth and see where that's going to take us. So I thought, now I'm getting older, you know, I'm on, uh, on the age ladder, and uh, I was turning, I was into my middle 60s, and I said, I've got to experiment with this power that they're talking about. And I'm going to do one of the last undone endurance feats of Arctic exploration at age 65. And if the old woman is right, and if I can dig into this power, if I can find it, I can do this. So we're going to circumnavigate Ellesmere Island. This is Greenland. It's up there. It's close to, to the North Pole. The North Pole is about there. The Arctic Circle is down here. It's closer to the North Pole than the Arctic Circle. 1,500 miles of travel of some of the har hardest terrain on Earth. We had 100 days to do it in with the vagaries of weather. That's 15 miles a day, half a marathon a day, every day for over three months pulling all your own loads. We were supposed to have eight food drops. Uh, we lost the one at Hell's Gate, McClintock, Alert, Alexander Mackinson. So we lost most of our food drops, which meant we were gonna go hungry, which meant in between our loads were going to be much heavier than we wanted them to be. So the team was uh, Eric Boomer, John Turk, Eric Boomer, John Turk, Eric Boomer, and John Turk. <laughs> and um, Boomer is 27, I was 65. We set out on this journey. This is May now. This uh, lecture series is about ocean exploration. This is the ocean, ladies and gentlemen. That's land. And this was no mistake. We didn't uh, goof up on this. You don't have enough time that far north to uh, complete the journey in open water. So we started in May when we knew it was going to be frozen. And, uh, and then things start warming up and we're, um, you know, it's beautiful. And then the snow, the snow firms up, no penetration here on our skis. We're really flying, things are looking pretty good. We're headed from the polar zone, excuse me, from the high Arctic into the polar zone. So that line, it's a line on a white man's map, I understand, but the 80 degree north latitude line is a significant um, passage, right? We're going into the high polar zone, 10 degrees from the North Pole. So we're going there and I'm uh, uncharacteristically watching my GPS, not the landscape, you see? Because we decide we're gonna camp right on 80, right? And I'm going along and I look in and then I look up and Whoa, this guy's already there, you know. He's right there. I'm telling you, I'm not making this up. He's right there at the 80 degree north latitude line. I mean, within a few feet. And he waited for us, you see, and then we set up the tent and he spent the night with us and uh, bivvied up right next to the tent, about that far from the tent, was there for breakfast, hung out with us for uh, yeah, about 12, 14, 14, 15 hours. So what do we make of this? Was this just sort of a random co coincidence, you see? But if you've hung out for five years with the Koryak people like I have, you, this is not a coincidence. There's something happening. There's a communication with that wolf. And what is that communication? Well, you're going to have to believe me because you can't record this communication. This is my my conversation with the wolf. So, was this the fairy godmother wolf that was going to grant us safe passage across the polar zone and say, John Boomer, I'm here to be your protector and wave the magic wand and everything is going to be hunky-dory? No! 
of course not. There's no fairy godmother wolf, you know. This wolf was saying very directly, hello, you're entering the polar zone. You're going to get tired. You're going to get hungry. You're going to get beat up. You're going to get cut. You might starve to death. You might die out here. Welcome. It's good to see you. Yeah. And, you know, I think one of the first things that we did, we as humanity, when we got agriculture and industrialization as everything, we decided vulnerability was a bad idea. See, if we feel vulnerable, we'll buy a bulldozer. We'll crush it. And if we're still vulnerable, we buy a bigger bulldozer. Well, you see, it doesn't work, you see. And one of the first lessons of deep ecology, one of the first lessons that everybody who spends time outside is, is you're going to get beat up, you're going to get snowed on, you're going to get rained on, you might die out here. Welcome. Oh, it's good to see you. And I think that's the first, no, I think I'm absolutely certain that's the first step into deep ecology. That's the first step into what I'm calling a consciousness revolution that I think is so sorely needed, especially this week, of relaxing and moving into the, and, and building this reciprocal relationship with the planet. So it starts warming up, and uh, this is still the ocean. This is still the sea ice, but now the snow on top of the sea ice has melted, and we're walking for days and days and days through this ice water, pulling the boats. It's slow walking. It's hard walking through knee-deep water, and your feet start to rot, and things start to fall apart. And then you get into uh, this region of big pressure ridge ice where you're dragging your boat. These boats are 250 pounds with all the food and everything in them dragging them up over these 30-foot pressure ridges, lowering them down. You've gone 20 yards. You have 15 miles to go that day. So things are getting tough. So what happens when things get tough? Well, two things happen. See, one is you get sore toes, and two is you journey into ecstasy. And I know there are people who are going to go, I don't believe this guy, you know. He's going off the deep edge. Well, let me, let, let me give you an example. I live in the, in the Rockies, in the Rocky Mountains in uh, Montana. So you're going for a hike. It's in July. You say, I'm going to go up on the ridge and go for a hike up in the Alpine Zone. You know, it's going to be a beautiful day. The sun is shining. Good weather report. You throw in an extra jacket just for the heck of it. And you get up on the ridge and you get a, a summer thunderstorm and it starts blowing and snowing and grappling and hailing and your hands are wet and you forgot your hat and you're cold and it's just howling. And yes, you are cold. And yes, it is nasty up there. But you wouldn't want to be any other place in the world. This is ecstasy. And the journey through pain, through complete involvement, is a journey into ecstasy. Yeah, the word ecstasy comes from the Latin root for total terror. Total terror. It's total involvement. It's shutting off that think-too-much-know-it-all know brain and going into that space of the swirling snowstorm or the sore toe. So uh, now we're going around, uh, we've gone along the north shore of Ellesmere, now we're going down the northeast coast. This is Greenland over here, there's a big constriction. Um, we're, we're walking along now, now remember the ocean has been like this, it's been frozen solid, right? And then all of a sudden, it starts to move. The whole ocean starts to move, like in a period of 15 seconds. It starts to move. And this is another really important lesson. You see, scientists talk about tipping points. Because when you disturb a system or perturbation, you start warming up the ice. It doesn't melt right away. And we've been living for a month on temperatures that are above freezing, but the ocean is still solid. But then it reaches a final critical point 
And in an amazingly short amount of time, it starts to move. And this is what climate scientists say is happening to the planet today. That we're perturbing it, but not that much has been happening, but it's building up for these sudden changes. And when you're out in nature, you see sudden changes all the time. The spring pops one day, the ice melts one day. This is one of the climate tipping points of the planet. And what goes on up here is critical to what goes on in the world in general. So now things are, are really dangerous. Um, they're, they're moving, the, you're jumping from flow to flow. If you fall in and the ice closes in on you, it'll squash you until your eyeballs pop out. And um, it's all in motion. So, how do you deal with this situation? Well, you've all heard the expression, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Yeah. That's another one of those ridiculous things that they teach us in kindergarten, you know. When the tough gets going, I I'm going to get tougher than the North Pole Ocean. You see, it doesn't work like that. And it becomes so obvious out there that we have to rethink our mentality. And I mean this on a personal level and a societal level for the civilization of our planet. I think, what would Mula not do out here? Who doesn't have that, doesn't own the bulldozer. And then I remember this woman, um, Marina, who told me, if you lose the magic in your life, you lose your power. She didn't say if you lose the keys to your bulldozer, you lose your power. If the stock market goes down and you lose your checking account, you lose your power. If you lose the magic, and that's the bottom, that's the foundation to me of deep ecology is finding the magic. And once you've found the magic, then everything else just unfolds. Then it's all easy. You see, even the sore toe, it becomes easy because you're in the magic. And a friend of mine told me that, oh, and, and this was a friend who's an extreme endurance athlete, he says, when the barriers are too tough, don't even try to go over them. You have to go through them. You have to make them go away in some, in some vision inside you. That's the magic. And that's what we're looking for. And that's what's going to get us move on into the 21st century without with any hope of uh, sanity, right? So um, we finished the circumnavigation. We didn't die. Everything worked out. But uh, I, I did sort of almost die, but we'll talk about that some other day. And then I get home, and um, I get this email from my friend Malu Bean. Now, Malu Bean is an interesting character. He... Um, he, he grew up in a very traditional background, just like me, except he grew up, his traditional background was in China, and uh, he lived through the Great Famine, 50 million people starved to death, people were eating other people. He lived through the Cultural Revolution, where uh, his father was imprisoned and tortured and so on, and he became a bicycle nomad in his old age. He was a... Um, a propagandist for Chairman Mao, you know, he made up slogans like death to America, uh, down with imperialism. And then when Chairman Mao went under, he became an advertising executive, and now he's a bicycle nomad. Um, so he wrote me an email, and he said, uh, let's take a bike ride across the Tibetan Plateau to the birthplace of the Dalai Lama, and I said, that'd be just fine. My wife joined us. We go to China. Um, you know, it's just crazy there. They're, they're, they're absorbing all the kinds of Western technology like Mickey Mouse and red carpets and stuff like that. And behind all that technology, of course, is the pollution of modern China. So we start uh, driving up, uh, riding our bikes, though not driving, up onto the Tibetan plateau and into the Tibetan culture. Now, it's important to understand what the Tibetan culture so one thing of, of the many about the Tibetan culture I want you to understand, and that is that at the end of World War II, after all this horrible destruction, 75 million people 
killed and all the nations rushing to industrialize and to build up a consumer society, Tibet as a nation, not as an individual, said, we're going to make an experiment. All these nations are rushing to industrialize. We're going to build a nation based on the Buddhist principles of love, compassion, compatibility with the earth, non-consumerism, community, simplicity. And we're going to be a symbol to the world of this alternate way of viewing your life. Well, what happened? Well, you all know what happened. The Chinese said, no, you can't do that. That's unacceptable. We're going to drive tanks in and we're going to capture you. And we're going to tell you you can't do that. And now today, they don't need the tanks anymore and they're conquering the Tibetan plateau with concrete. This is a big superhighway system. How many cars are on it? Zero. There's no cars here yet. They're just building cities and concrete roadways and concrete and tons and tons and zillions of tons of concrete to bring civilization. Because the very existence of civilization is going to refute the Tibetan ideal. This is heavy stuff, ladies and gentlemen. This is, we're serious here. So we're, we're going on, you know, and then we finally get off the paved road after a long ride. Now it's time is going on and we're, we're getting into the fall. Oh, yeah, did I tell you we were looking for the birthplace of the Dalai Lama? Well, we were totally lost, you know, it was like ridiculous. You know, look. Let me tell you something. If you're on a kind of a Buddhist pilgrimage and you don't get what you want, you know, you can't get too grumpy, right? That's just, you know, you got to play by the rules. So, you know, we had given up. It was a good bike ride. We weren't going to find the birthplace of the Dalai Lama. Oh, well. And we ended up going around this holy mountain, but we were going counterclockwise instead of clockwise. All the pilgrims who were going around in the proper direction we're telling, we're very worried because they were concerned that we were going to unravel all of our prayers. So there was some discussion about that. Okay. In the time just before, during, and just after our trip, there were a hundred Tibetans who poured gasoline over their heads and lit themselves on fire. A hundred. To say, the world refuses to listen to us. We have no voice. We're doing this to tell you people that there is another way with more compassion. And this is the only way we know of to get you to listen to us. You're riding with that in, your, in the back of your head every day. We cross the pass, going down on the other side, and what do we see? We see a drill rig. What are they drilling for? They're coring the holy mountain to find out what kind of rock it's made out of so they can dig a tunnel under it so we can go under the tunnel and we can make the journey faster. Okay. So we, we finish the trip a couple of months, we get back to Jining, back to our starting point, and we meet this journalist. He said, we're here, you're going to the birthplace of Dalai Lama, you passed it on day two, the last 58 days you've been totally lost. He <laughs> takes us to it, and there it is, there's the house that the Dalai Lama was born in, and this is his niece, and she was not actually happy to see us. She said, you know, foreigners have caused us a lot of trouble. Could, could you just go away? You know, no great mantra, you know. And now I'm going to read. I have two small sections to read out of the Raven's Gift. Not the Raven's Gift. Crocodiles and Ice. I hate to say that a particular landscape or structure holds religious significance because then some true believer will start a war to attack or defend it. So I refused to think that I had visited a specific place. Instead, it was more about a feeling. Nothing significant happened. 
We reached our goal finally and received a frightened human reception. Not a blessing or a mantra. Yet I still had a deep internal feeling that the house was a symbol of refuge in the madness. Human beings herding sheep in the cold fog, snowy mountains, hand stacked sheaves of barley, sun baked bricks. Sustenance, peace, compassion, rising out of the land, sustainable and full of hope. So this is the Koryak view of the world that I learned out there, that there, our spirituality, our consciousness revolution, our journey <laughs> forward rests on the shaman, the spiritual leader, the hunter, the pragmatist, and the hunter is the practical person, but also the person that has a deep reciprocal relationship with the landscape and the tundra itself, which gives us our power. So I, I'm writing this book, you see, and I'm on page 300, and I'm, I'm thinking I'm at the end of it, and now I'm starting to get worried that somebody's going to pick it up, you know, like they picked it up and said, I don't believe in shamans, I'm not going to read this book, right? And I'm saying somebody's going to say, I don't want to go get cold and miserable out there in the ice. I don't want to ride my bike about the Tibetan Plateau. So this book doesn't have any meaning for me, so I'm not going to read your book or listen to your message. That's not what I want. So I worked for two and a half years with a dance company out of Boston, Weber Dance, as a storyteller. We configured my, uh, we choreographed my stories into a dance. And we were dancing all over the country in San Francisco, and this is in Boston and San Francisco. Even I got to dance, you know, it was pretty cool. And um, we were in Colorado, and we had this grant from some somebody. Somebody gave us money, you see. And they there was we were giving performances to adult audiences at night, and we had to go to schools during the day. They sent us to this uh, youth recovery center which seemed more like a prison than a school to me, you see. The young, young children criminals, 14 to 18 years old, kids who had made mistakes and gotten tied up in drugs, some of them were violent. Bars on the window, guards with guns, yeah. And we walked into the faculty room and the, the, the dean of students or the warden, whatever he was, said, uh, I'd, I'd like you guys to take an hour and turn these kids' lives around. And I said, yeah, right, thank you. You know, I, we're not making that much money at this project. You know, I'll go, it's a beautiful spring day, I'll go for a walk down by the river. But the kids filed in and sat in this semicircle around us, and there was one girl about 15 chewing on a water bottle like it was a baby bottle. These were disturbed people. They were beaten. And we got up there and we, 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 hadn't, we hadn't practiced this. We were just a, a troop of dancers and, and people very close. When you're performing on stage, you, you get very close in a, a very interesting way. We toot the feeling of each other. And Jody, the choreographer, says, John, why don't you talk first? I had no idea what I was going to say. So I say, you know, Everybody gets broken sometimes. We break our leg, we break our arm, we break our spirit. Society gets broken sometimes. <laughs> things happen. Bad things happen. Nobody makes it through life without bad things happening. So we have to learn how to heal. We have to learn about healing as individuals, as communities, as nations, as societies. We have to learn about healing. And healing is about passion. And the dancers came up, it was all improv theater, and the dancers started dancing the dance of healing. 
And at the end of that hour, we had every single one, 100% of those children criminals up and dancing, the dance of moving forward, of getting out of this bad space they were in and getting into a good space of beauty and ecstasy, every one, 100%. Last paragraph of my book, and I think it's safe to paraphrase what the Dalai Lama is so patiently and assiduously telling us. That if we free our mind of all the extraneous input and confusion, the random useless stories we invent for no good reason, we might be lucky enough so that the empty space that remains will fill with ecstasy. And then ecstasy will morph seamlessly into compassion for ourselves, our neighbors, and our planet. That one word, compassion, stands out loud and strong in all of the Dalai Lama's writings and teachings as a consciousness revolution that will be the beginning of healing. Is it really that simple? Or should I say, why are we making it that complex and difficult? Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, folks, we have time if you want to have a couple of questions for John. I'm sure he'd be happy to answer them before we wrap tonight. Yeah, thanks, Blaine. And before we um, take the first question, I'm going to ask a favor of everybody. We really do, we really are in the midst of difficult times right now. And I really want everybody here to make a commitment to passing these messages along, to telling people, if, if you like my book, fine, pass the message around, put it up on Facebook, send out emails to your friends. If you don't like my book, that's fine too, but keep that message alive. I think it's really important right now. Okay, now we'll, we'll let the questions, we'll take the questions, questions. Yeah, no, you're just holding on because you think this is a ship and you, you don't want to <laughs> fall off. Just to the Dalai Lama is living in exile. What's going to happen? Is he ever going to be allowed to go back? Do you think that the Chinese government will just persecute him? Will the Dalai Lama be allowed to go back to Tibet? Right. Never. Oh, I can't answer that question. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I can't answer that question. I can't predict the future of the Chinese politics. I refuse to get into that one. Um, I'm just saying that the message is so amazing. I was in Banff and, um, you know, you have to just, you have to feel it to realize how powerful that Tibetan message is. Go hang out with um, some of these people if you get the opportunity, because it's there and it's really powerful. And um, whether he gets physically to go back to Tibet or not is, I mean, will our whole planet get to go back to sanity? That's the question you're asking. And do I know the answer to that? No, I just know that we have to try. Yeah. Do you have a plan for what's next for yourself? What's that? Do you have a plan for what is next? I'm getting old. I have a plan. My plan is to grow old. <laughs> wow. This is going to be really cool. Um, I have a lot of plans, and they're all... Uh, I was at Harvard Travelers Club yesterday, and some woman who was a, a wildlife biologist at Harvard said, would you like to come and track lions with me? in Kenya, and I 
That hadn't been my plan before yesterday, but I stayed in. I'm coming track lions with you in Kenya, so my plan right now is to track lions in Kenya. I have to tell my wife. She, and I think she, I, I'm pretty. She wants it to be. She'll come. Oh, she'll come enthusiastically. So the plan is to track lions in Kenya and to grow. Old. Um, more questions. How are we doing on time? We got a few more. We're okay. Time for a couple more questions. Yeah. When you were on those ice floes, yeah. how did you know where to step and what to do? Mm. Boomer fell in once, I fell in twice. Boomer's twice as coordinated as I am. Um, you don't, I mean, you know, it, it's... You look at something and you see where the densest, heaviest part of the ice is, and then you see where the little thin parts of the ice is, and you try to hit the densest part. And you, what we did is, because you, you get running, and you start running, because if you stop, that's not a good idea if you're gonna tip over. So we would long line the boats. We'd put long pieces of rope on the boats and run across, jumping across the ice, until we got to a bigger, thicker, a big flow. Some of the flows are five miles in diameter. Some of them are as big as a golf ball. They're all different sizes. And then you get to a, a big flow, and you stop and you rest, and then you line your boat over to you. But we were making, um, it, when the ice got really uh, treacherous, we were averaging a mile a day. We, we did 17 miles in one 17-day period. So, you know, I can be a wise guy and tell you, you know, that, you know, we jumped around dancing, but it was pretty treacherous work and we didn't go very fast. Yeah. So I think that you've taken uh, a fair number of trips in kayaks. Yeah. Everybody got the question? No. No? no. What, well, how do you find joy in... Uh, sea kayaking is essentially a monotonous activity. You're just paddling. How do you find joy in that day and not get bored? Is that kind of your question? Yeah. That it's just another, it's just a big long slog. Okay? If you're walking the Pacific Coast Trail or, or kayaking across the Pacific, how do you turn that moment into joy? Um, I worked as a safety consultant for the Montana Railroad, uh, Montana Rail Link. They were uh, hauling big loads of chlorine gas, uh, 100 freight car loads of chlorine gas uh, each Tank car load could kill a million people, 100 cars through Missoula at night, you know, on a regular basis. And uh, they brought me in as a safety consultant because it was just this question. You're driving the choo-choo train, you know, you're the engineer, you're driving back and forth across the Montana Prairie every day, and you forget that you've got enough chlorine gas in here to kill 100 million people, you see, you're just getting bored and you smash up the train. And my job is to tell them not to smash up the train, you see. And you see, try this as an experiment. Sit at your desk at the computer doing something. I don't know, something. Do answering emails, filling out your income tax form. Uh, doing your job, selling insurance, so buy, buy and selling stocks, whatever you do, and sit there for 12 hours. And then get up, stretch, and go for a walk in the woods. I'll guarantee you, every single human being, it's 100%, you feel, ah, 
Some great sponge pulls all the junk out of you and some great wonder comes inside. I guarantee you. And what I'm saying you do is you just shut your mind off from thinking about something other than the ocean. The ocean is really complicated. There's a lot going on. Think about that line that I said, keep your scrotums on the bow stems, ladies and gentlemen. That's a line out of something that's real. The Pacific navigators, that's how they that's how they felt the waves. When you want to feel a complex wave pattern, you put your scrotums on the bow stem and you feel how that boat is moving with response to an old swell and a new swell and yesterday's storm and today's little gale and the, the big swell from across the Pacific. And you feel that. And if you start feeling that and not thinking about something else, just think about that. You think every wave is the same? No. Every wave is different. And the difference between living and dying out there is knowing what those waves are doing. And once you get into that headspace, it's not boring anymore. That's all. It's that simple. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great question. Yeah. John, when I say the word read, I'm uh, referring to reading books. What's that, John? Reading books. Yeah, what about reading? What is your current read? What am I reading right now? I'm reading a strange book called Jerusalem about um, poverty, and it's a 1,500-page novel about poverty in uh, England at the turn of the century. I'm not sure I'm going to get through all 1,500 pages. But I've just been to Banff and traded books with a lot of the, the top adventure writers of the world today. And I got a big stack of uh, different books. And every one of these writers, I got a big stack of them, John, that I traded for. Everyone is saying the same thing that I'm saying, that this journey into adventure is a journey into sanity. Who gets to define sanity? Thanks for that, John. One more? Last one. And then Last we'll one. On. Last question? Yeah. Did you give even the smallest morsel of food to that wolf? And <laughs> what was its reaction? We did not give even a small morsel of food to that wolf. Um, there is an argument that the wolf was there begging for food. And you can make that argument, and um, we can talk about it all day, and nobody knows who's right. I think the wolf is there to talk to us. But we did not feed it, and I would not have fed it, and I would never feed it. That was not what was, that would have been a bad thing. And we didn't have that much food. <laughs> okay, thank you all very much. Books for sale at uh, the end. Here we go. Thanks, Wayne.